Hello and welcome back to Mind Over Chatter, the Cambridge University podcast. I'm James. And I'm Nick. And together we're inviting you to join us in our conversations with clever, curious people here in Cambridge. Just like you, we have questions about the world. Deceptively simple questions. So one series at a time, just as fast as our little brains will allow, we'll bring together the best and the brightest to talk about these simple questions. In this first series, we're talking about climate change. Climate change is likely to affect almost every area of our lives, like a toddler with sticky fingers. So in this fifth episode of the series, we're asking the question, is climate change actually being taken seriously? So Martin Rees had to leave early during the recording, uh, apparently to attend some sort of important debate in the House of Lords. Um, So we've had to sort of sprinkle some of his contributions throughout the conversation. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I was kind of secretly hoping that he left his um, mic on his laptop off mute. And he, you know, when he had to go to use the bat phone to call into the House of Lords, and we could have just heard some, you know, House of Lords chatter about decisions. I I hate to burst your bubble, but I think we probably could have watched it on Parliament TV or something like this. In fact, actually, I don't know how that works when it's all virtual. No, they can't have them all broadcasting on Zoom, can they? I mean, that would be fascinating. You get to see the living rooms of all the members of the House of Lords. Martin, Martin, you there? You're on mute. (laughs) Um, Thankfully, however, Martin is uh, far too clever to do anything like that and did indeed mute himself um, when he went off to take part in matters of state. So... Who were we talking to in this episode? We talked to a lecturer in the history and the philosophy of science. My name's Richard Staley. An author, researcher and broadcaster. Hello, uh, I'm Sarah Dillon. And a cosmologist and astrophysicist. Well, I'm Martin Rees. As usual, we began by asking... In the sort of mosaic sort of sphere of climate change, where does your research fit in? In my day job is being an astronomer, but I've been involved for the last 10 or 20 years in worrying about the long-term future and the risks that are arising because of what we humans are doing to the planet. Because there are more of us on the planet than ever before. We're using more energy, using more resources, and we need to think in a global way about how we can uh, do better and ensure we leave a sustainable planet for next generations. My uh, interest in climate change is is both personal, as I think it is for many people now, but also I have a book coming out next year with Claire Craig at Oxford called Story Listening, not storytelling, story listening. Um, And it's about how we can take stories seriously when we're trying to make uh, collective decisions about issues such as climate change and artificial intelligence and and other sort of science-related issues like that. I began work in climate change um, in the early 2000s and took it up seriously from around 2010 because I thought it's really important to teach the history of climate change to um, people in in the university. Since then, I've developed a research project here in Cambridge with a, a group of colleagues. We're looking at the relations between making and knowing climate over the last 200 years. That is over the entire period that it's taken to reform our climate um, and started heating and to know that we're reforming and changing our climate. If we start with the initial question of um, why has it taken so long for climate change to be taken seriously, we're sort of hoping that you guys can sort of help us unpack that a little bit. We thought it'd be helpful to start by looking back in history and focusing on some of the stories we tell about climate change. Sarah or Richard, looking towards you guys, how did we sort of start telling stories about the environment? Yeah, so one of the things that we think is really important is to look back a little bit further than the last 20 or 30 years, which is a focus of a lot of attention in thinking about climate change in the present and near near future. But if we do look back to the the past, um, around 1800, that is around the period that steam engines were beginning to become really important, um, we think that physics was also importantly an environmental science. Um, the, The first person to focus on the question of the need for the atmosphere to retain the Earth's heat Um, was a French scientist, Joseph Fourier, and he'd been thinking about conduction and convection of heat and providing um, equations to do that, and he was thinking in global terms. Uh, And he and others were strongly aware that um, the heat, that that the Earth was giving off heat, um, and they wanted to understand um, why um, it wasn't cooling 
uh, as quickly as it should, given the, the, the physics that they they knew. Um, and then there have been various periods over, over time in which people have brought out different elements of um, the argument required to understand um, how the planet's um, heat budget um, was being formed. And each time a new one was was advanced in the 19 in, in the early 1800s and then 1900s, um, they had different concerns and a focus on carbon and on um, understanding glaciers and ice ages emerged slowly over that period. And each time a new answer was, was offered, then it was shot down by others because um, the di interdisciplinary expertise required to understand weather and climate um, on, a, on a global scale is, is um, really quite extraordinary. Um, and our story, our understanding of it, only began to firm into the kind of account that we now have um, in the period after World War II. Um, and, and then it proved very um, controversial for a number of different reasons. Um, and we can go into that later, perhaps. Well, my, because my expertise is is um, imaginary stories, um, I, I was listening to Richard thinking about how I would map that on to sp specifically the history of science fiction, actually, um, which is the genre that has uh, most rigorously and consistently engaged with ideas about about climate. Um, and of course, uh, pulp science fiction, you're looking early early 20th century, but it's also, there's lots of stories about the climate changing in science fiction. The only, you only start to get the stories about human beings being responsible for it in about the 70s and 80s, which matches with this post-war period that Richard ended on. So Richard, what, what, what happened then? Why do you think there was a shift after the war? Um, one of the key questions was understanding the relations between the Earth's atmosphere and its oceans. Um, mm -hmm. And they're critical to understanding where carbon might be going in, in the carbon cycle. And it was in the late 1950s that people realized that um, the oceans weren't taking up all, all the carbon um, and that uh, there would be uh, a likely problem. Um, and they began, scientists began focusing on that as a major issue from then. And around the 1970s, they really started to argue that we might need to worry about global warming. Um, but at the same time, people were worrying about the possibility of global cooling with lots of particles in the air and, and, and the like. So it was a, a fraught question. Um, and as different uh, elements were, were developed, one of the remarkable and interesting things is that... Um, uh, governments and states found it too economically and socially um, critical to feel that they wanted to go it alone. Um, and the move towards the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that came um, around 1990 was in part because America didn't want to take sole responsibility for a problem that they began to see lo looming. Seeing as we're talking about stories, what is the sort of purpose of a story? Like, can you break it down? How do they work? <laughs> uh, well, the whole of our new book is structured around the function of stories, so I should be able to answer that question. Um, so obviously you can divide um, stories. There's two ways in which they, they work, and, and there's um, posh words for that. There's the um, idonic and the eudonic. So they can give pleasure um, or they can give wisdom. And um, we often focus on the first one. We often focus on just stories as being entertaining because we, we all love that. Um, and that can actually mean that we forget that stories are a form of thinking and that they're a form of knowledge and also that they're incredibly powerful. I think I think their power, particularly their pers persuasive power, is now much more recognised given the, uh, things that have happened in the, in the West over the last sort of five years or so. Um, but that shouldn't detract from the ways in which stories can serve to offer us insight and understanding into different people's points of view. Um, I absolutely do not think that they make us more empathetic, but we can argue that in a different podcast. Um, they give us understanding of people's points of view. They, um, they create collective identities around powerful stories and the way in which we share stories. Um, they and this is a, a, a function I'm really interested in, they're models. And this is something to really think about in relation to climate change. Um, stories are narrative models. They model parts of the world so that we can then think about that world and transfer knowledge back to it. 
and of course climate change is you know is a, is a future issue to some extent and so models in the science are crucial um, and how might it be productive to think about na narrative models helping us here as well as scientific models um, and the last thing that they do is they help us anticipate the future so every decision that we make is dependent upon thinking about the future and anticipating the future and stories are absolutely crucial in helping us do that you mentioned um climate fiction earlier no i didn't right <laughs> <laughs> i very much didn't mention climate fiction i don't use the word fiction uh on on purpose so uh, and this is something to re to really be very careful about so because um uh, there was a wonderful uh, special issue on climate fictions um, are in the journal Paradoxa this year. And there's a very good essay, and forgive me, because I, I don't know the author and therefore I can't recall the name, but um, who makes the case, and it's a case we make as well. You know, climate models are fictions. And that is not to say that they are not true, that they don't contain truth, but they're about the future. And we can't, we cannot know the future. Therefore, everything about the future is, is in some way fictional so the and the word fiction becomes very problematic because we think about fiction as things that aren't true um, but stories might be made up they might be imaginative but that doesn't mean they don't contain truths so I, I find using the words fact and fiction in relation to stories very unhelpful actually especially in relation to climate change and I think if you took that up in thinking about the way that modelers approach the future now, they do so in terms of scenarios and yeah. often in terms of working out what kind of scenarios would enable us to, say, reach a point where we don't go over two degrees centigrade rise in, in temperature. Um, and if one thinks about all the different ingredients that have to go into those scenarios, only part of it is the physical understanding of the Earth, its atmosphere, and, and the relationships there. A great deal of it is to do with social and economic facts and industrial growth in different places and where resources come from and the importance of transport and so on. So understanding all those relationships uh, is very conjectural and difficult, um, and it requires people to work together from, from many different perspectives. If I can, if I can turn to Martin at this point. So I'm curious, Martin, what you feel about this idea of models, for example, as fiction. So how do you think about models which you might have used or discuss in a scientific context? Do you think of those as as stories, as fiction, as narratives? Well, they're not. They're reliable if the input is unreliable. So you've got to get the best data and have a good understanding and you don't always have either of those things so for that reason we don't really uh, have 100% confidence in any of the uh, uh, projections we make of the future that's true for the pandemic in the short term but that's also true about uh, climate but we have a range of uncertainty and a range where we will bet it will end up so we can make predictions but I'd like to go back and uh, talk about the climate in the past because um, uh, what is special now is that we have good reason to think that the climate is changing now because of collective human actions. The climate has been changing all the time through geological history. Um, in fact, the last 8,000 years are unusually stable. There's evidence uh, for, for this um, and the ice ages and all that, which we understand. And um, to take one local example, I don't know if you've been to the um, Sidgwick Museum in the university, uh, there you will find the Barrington Hippopotamus. This is a, a, um, a skeleton of a hippopotamus which lived in Barrington, a village near Cambridge. And that indicates that the climate certainly has changed over time, <laughs> hundreds of years. That's a great example. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so everyone knows uh, that the climate has changed. And uh, that is... Um, uh, due to various astronomical effects we understand. But what is special now is that uh, there is an effect that we understand very well, uh, which is causing the Earth to warm up. And it's because carbon dioxide is being produced by burning fossil fuels. And this um, um, allows light in from the sun. But uh, uh, if the Earth tries to radiate, radiate infrared, then 
the carbon dioxide acts as like a blanket and stops it getting out. So it is like a greenhouse where uh, the light comes in, uh, but the heat can't get out. And um, this was first uh, realized at the end of the 19th century, um, but only uh, in much later times has it been studied in detail, and only in the last 50 years has it been happening in a serious way, because there are more of us and uh, far more fossil fuels are being burnt. So it is something which is modern, and uh, as you say, we can model the future, but what happens depends very much on the amount of carbon dioxide that we produce by burning fossil fuels. Um, and of course, this leads to the politics. How are we going to persuade people uh, to think long enough term to actually ensure that the world doesn't get into some runaway heating phase? Well, we've done it before and we'll do it again, looking to the past to understand where we've got to and how. Yep, grab your DeLoreans and flux capacitors as we're dialing it back to around 1800, when physics was as much an environmental science as anything else. I believe you just made a back to the future joke. I am so proud. Anyway, yes, we heard about Joseph Fourier. Fourier? Fourier? Who was around in the late 1700s and early 1800s. He was a natural philosopher, mathematician, and Egyptologist, because, you know, one field just isn't enough. Well, he did some groundbreaking maths on the theory of heat transfer, and was the first to propose that the Earth's atmosphere helped raise the planet's temperature. The idea was that gases in the atmosphere, such as CO2, prevent heat from escaping, so that the Earth remains warmer than an equivalent bare rock drifting along at the same distance from the sun. Is that it? Is that our only options? Either the Earth or a bare rock? So it seems. And do you remember Eunice Foote? Uh, do you mean the one of footnote fame? You do remember Eunice Foote. Well, about 100 years after Fourier, the experiments she conducted actually supported his earlier theories. But despite lots of great minds thinking about the Earth and its climate and atmosphere, it wasn't really until after the Second World War that the various different expertise needed to understand climate change from lots of different areas of science began to come together. For example, it wasn't until the late 1950s that people started noticing that the oceans weren't absorbing as much carbon as normal and that this could cause global warming. And looking at storytelling actually backs this up. Stories about climate change where humans are responsible weren't really being told until the 1970s and 80s. And talking of stories, Sarah explained to us some of the functions of stories. So, for example, they can help us understand other people's points of view, help us anticipate the future and help us make decisions. Basically, stories help us think about the world and perhaps understand it better or at least differently. Sounds a lot like science to me, if I do say so myself. But if we think of stories as a little like scientific models, then Martin reminds us that models, even scientific ones, can be unreliable, especially if the input is unreliable. We can never be 100% confident in our predictions about the future, but we can give a rough idea of how certain we are. Martin also gave us what I'll call the cosmic perspective, basically what is special now compared to previous occasions when the climate has changed. So the climate may have changed in the past, and he told us about how hippos used to live in Cambridge, fossils at the Sedgwick Museum if you're interested. But now the climate is changing because of human activity. I bet the Cambridge swans would give the hippos a run for their money. Could you imagine if instead of cows on Jesus Green, it was just hippos? This is literally the stuff of nightmares. Absolutely. There would be absolutely zero chance of any punting wars on the cam ever again, though. The, uh, uh, there's something Richard mentioned earlier and that, that uh, Martin's reminded me of, which is um, Richard talked about weather and climate, which, of course, are actually quite distinct things scientifically, but they're not for a lay person. We experience the climate primarily through the weather. Um, and one of the reasons it might be that climate change might, and I'm, I'm caveating all this, be, be t starting to be taken more seriously now is because we're starting to see immediate effects 
in weather. So, you know, the wildfires or we all know now that, you know, our summers are warmer than they were when we were little and things like that. And that always reminds me of something from psychology called the availability bias, which is, um, you know, if you see a car crash, you're then more likely to think that there are going to be car crashes for a certain amount of time afterwards. So there's something about us now thinking that thinking that we're getting more and experiencing more extreme weather events might have a knock on effect in therefore taking climate change as a big issue more seriously. Can I, can I raise yeah. another example um, which highlights the importance of, of stories? Um, when Cook and Bank arrived in Australia, um, they met the Dawal people uh, in the region around Botany Bay. Um, and they interacted with them rather um, sporadically, and they didn't learn much of their language, certainly in, that, in those first meetings. Um, and when uh, in Britain they were beginning to think about whether Australia should be colonised, they turned to Banks, and Banks drew upon his knowledge of latitude and the zones, the climate zones of the earth. And he presumed that climate was stable in, in doing that. Um, and that was very much a picture that, that was important for um, uh, Western science for quite a long, long period, the stability of climate. Um, but if he'd been able to talk to the Darawa people, as people have done recently, they would have discovered that those people have in their oral traditions both stories and myths that describe a period when um, the cove that they had sailed into was in fact a swamp um, and was unnavigable. Uh, and was a site where two different rivers um, mess and um, flowed in, in through one swampy area. Um, and scientists now know that those stories relate to a period that is between 7,900 years ago and 9,000 years ago. Um, so there's a very long-term memory retained in the cultural understanding of Aboriginal people. I um, mean, I'm sure that they were integrating climate and weather in the way that they understand their local regions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ab absolutely. Indigenous stories are so important here. There's a there's a wonderful novel by Alexis Wright, who's a, a Australian uh, novelist called Black Swan, um, which is um, which is just phenomenal and fascinating on climate change. Um, the the climate refugees in that novel are, are all the kind of white Westerners who have been sort of forced to take to the seas. The other reason it's fascinating is because it's actually quite a difficult book because it's playing with time in ways that are not necessarily familiar to a, a Western reader um, and make us think differently about this idea that time is just linear um, and that we've got a kind of end goal that we can either achieve or uh, not achieve, or that with, or that there's a sort of value in relentless progress through time. So I'd really encourage people to to try that, even though I think it is a a really a really hard book. I know, Richard, you sort of touched on this a little bit earlier, but thinking about um, storytelling again, how do sort of stories differ? How does storytelling differ across the world? Well, I think one of the things to bear in mind there as the example from Australia shows, is it depends a lot upon the particular conditions in particular places. Um, and in Australia, the stories that people tell about climate now have a lot to do with drought and fire and water um, and the scarcity of water. In, in Britain, uh, stories about climate change are much more likely to centre upon um, storms and floods and um, the difficulties of, of, of those kinds of climatic phenomena. Just a, a short distance away in Ireland, um, climate change is much harder to talk about in those terms because um, it's such a temperate environment uh, and there's such little variation in, in the weather and climate that the effects are not very visible. They don't even think about heat waves there in the way that people in Britain have begun to think about heat waves. Um, but nevertheless, a, a change of, of a one degree centigrade there might change insect life in Ireland dramatically. Um, so I think the stories uh, and ways people think about it do reflect their um, geographical situation a great deal. I mean, it also does reflect the kind of um, cultural environment and, and political environment in which they um, live, live and work. Uh, in Britain, um, there's a conservative government in power and it isn't as ideologically driven as the Republican government in the United States or um, the Liberal government in, in Australia. 
and attitudes towards climate change have been subtly different in Britain than in those two different places and different again than they are in, in Germany. Um, so our cultures and, and our social settings affect the way that we, we, we think about climate too. I've wondered whether um, one sees a, a big difference in working class people in Britain and their attitudes towards climate uh, and uh, highly educated and, and upper class people. Um, there might be big distinctions there too and the kind of stories and ways that one they, they draw upon those might be different. Sarah, have you seen any sort of phenomena like that with, with your interest in different kinds of stories? Well, I, I just think it's such an important point because the idea that there might be like one story to save them all, I'm thinking very Lord of the Ringsy now, <laughs> um, it, it, it's a colonial viewpoint to some extent. You know, who who's the we that's telling that story mm -hmm. um, that can somehow mm -hmm. cohere um, rapidly different experiences um, in different locales around the world. It, it's, it, it would be a, it would be a, I just think, I, I, I understand the sentiment behind it, which is how can we rally everybody together to save the planet? Like there's, I understand that, but I think it, it misses um, the subtleties and the nuances and the complexities. And always when you try and create something universal, you know, in the, in the history, we've defaulted to the kind of the, the white, often male you know uh we that's that's constructing the story so i, I just think that's so important um there's, there's two things that that what richard was just saying really brought to mind one was the comment about the insects in ireland because um when you talk about charismatic megafauna you know charismatic mm -hmm. big creatures like like um uh the polar bear um yeah. they do have power um to to mobilize action um, and they can be therefore very useful and very important, but they also sort of serve like magnets that attract attention towards them, which means attention isn't being paid to all the other things that aren't quite as charismatic, like the dung beetle. I'm sure there was something on Radio 4 the other day about the dung beetle. That's, that is not a charismatic megafauna <laughs> in any way whatsoever. That actually might be a really important uh, way of thinking about climate change. So. But I wholeheartedly agree with Martin that we need charismatic stories and we need charismatic individuals, but we also need to recognise where there's what we call in the book narrative deficits, where there's thing, stories aren't being told um, or are being told and aren't being heard. And it's so what we need is that is that multiplicity. Um, the other thing that Richard said that 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 made me think about different regions is the way in which climate change is manifesting in stories um, is slightly beginning to change. So um, any story that assumes a future where the climate is the same is about climate change, but it's assuming that nothing is going to go wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so so all so EastEnders. Coronation Street, any 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 mainstream story that that doesn't assume that things are changing is a story about climate change to some extent. And at BAFTA actually picked up on this. They did a survey with a company or an institute called Albert. From uh, they looked at all the subtitling data from the twenty seventh to twenty eighteen on the BBC, ITV, Channel Four, and Sky. I think. And the, the reason subtitling data is very helpful is it's, it's, a, it's an easily, uh, a, you can mine the data set very easily mm. for keywords. So they literally just did a really quite simple kind of digital humanities exercise and counted how many times climate change was mentioned compared to lots of other words. And <laughs> the results are actually quite shocking. So climate change was mentioned over that year 3,125 times. Okay, chocolate was mentioned 32,919 <laughs> no. times. Climate change ranked roughly about the same number of mentions as zombies <laughs> and having a wee. Like that's that's Jeez. like that's like the the level at which sort of you're just mainstream <laughs> programming is is mentioning this. And and I just think that, that and and BAFTA have been it's a really important report which is like this has got to change. Um and, and, and it makes me think that's in the UK. Australia, there's a wonderful um, example of, of a novel that, that is doing that, that's engaging with climate change without engaging with climate change, really, which is Jane Harper's bestseller, The Lost Man. Um, now, it's a kind of popular, you know, murder mystery kind of, um, you know, uh, good 
good plot pulls you through but and i don't want to ruin it for everybody um but but client the, the effects of extreme heat play a really important role in the in the murder plot and you can read it and find out why but they're there as the background it's not mm. a novel about climate change but it's a novel that is about climate change because climate change features in it as part of the environment in which the characters are functioning and cleverly as a kind of key murder plot element so uh, i think mainstream storytelling has, has got a, a lot of work to do actually to start to incorporate climate change in ways that aren't just a kind of apocalyptic you know disaster movie or something like that there's a subtle thing that i've seen in my work on uh, climate sciences in the 1960s and 1970s and how it's changed since then and that is that in the 1960s and 1970s people talked about climatic change um, mm -hmm. because they presumed that they were relating that to particular areas and that there were lots of different kinds of climatic change. Um, and we've shifted to climate change and shifted to thinking about global temperature as being the key. And in many ways it is the key, but actually it is associated with a whole host of different phenomena as Martin was describing earlier. Um, so we need to think in terms of climate change and climatic change. And if I can just ask, sorry, I was gonna ask Martin again at this point, that do you feel that you use stories, for example, when talking about climate change, perhaps with policymakers and politicians, with whom I know you have plenty of experience mm -hmm. of talking to? You know, will you deploy a story or do you feel that there's sort of a tension in some way between telling a story and communicating the science? Well, it's the same thing. It's, the point is you've got to make some projection of what the world will be like 50 or 100 years from now, make it sufficiently graphic that people uh, take it in. Um, if you just show them a graph of the temperature rising by three degrees or something, that doesn't really mean anything. And incidentally, the um, uh, temperature rise that everyone talks about in the climate discussions, that's just an index for large scale global changes in climate, which may lead to much bigger rises in some places. But to answer your question, uh, clearly uh, what one has to make people uh, uh, realize what will happen and incidentally one of the things we're trying to do uh, here in Cambridge and other places is to try and work out what the effects will be in different parts of the world hmm. climate change hmm. because um, uh, what matters to a politician is will there be a, a serious drought uh, more frequently in my country or uh, what will happen to the glaciers and all that what about the water flow so it's really very very important to be able to bring down uh, the scale from the global scale uh, to something which really matters to people and which can really be protected against. I think that's really important. And um, it's also notable that uh, prominent climate scientists have often written with their grandchildren or children in mind. One major example is, is Jim Hansen, who was so important in raising um, the question in 1988 and 1989, who um, in 2009, so 20 years after beginning that, that kind of work, wrote us a, a book called Storms of My Grandchildren. Um, and Michael yeah. Mann is another climate scientist who's written, in fact, a ch children's book to try and convey the issues that are important in, in his field. Yes, and to give another example, my good friend Chris Rapley at London, he's given a sort of a, a stage show called uh, 2071. He chose yeah. that date because that's mm. when his uh, grandchildren will be the age he is now. Um, and he, he, he does this sort of thing. But I think, um, going back to what we said earlier, uh, the, the, the problem is it is very hard to give people direct evidence for the climate change now because there are fluctuations, not just obviously seasonal ones, but there's something called the El Nino, a flow pattern in the um, Pacific, uh, which can affect uh, the climate on a time scale of about five years, etc. So you've got to sort of smooth out over... Um, time much longer than those fluctuations before you can be sure that you're detecting the uh, systemic temperature rise. And that's why it's very hard to uh, get convincing evidence. Um, but that's coming now because we have longer records. That was the big issue when um, James Hansen, Jim Hansen, raised his, his question. And one of the interesting things about that period in, in the 1980s, later 1980s, 
was that he was ready to go with a balance of judgment um, and to say, we, we don't know for sure, but it's so important that we should um, take steps now, given the consequences, if it, it, it does turn mm. out to be true. And others said, we need more evidence. Um, we need definitive evidence. We need fingerprinting. Yeah. We need to know that it's human caused and can be directly attributed to humans. Um, yeah. And that um, in fact, in a way, delayed uh, action being taken in, in, in many different places. Well, that's right. Yeah. There was reluctance to take any action because uh, it was very uncertain. But of course, even now, of course, um, what we don't know is um, how big the effect is. There are still some uncertainties in the science. Um, but the way I would put it is that the, um, the most likely scenario is pretty bad but there's a 5% chance of something really, really bad. And there's a stronger motive for action in order to eliminate the really, really bad consequence than there is to eliminate the, uh, um, uh, the more likely consequence. So it's the, what's called a long tail of the risk, the small chance of something really, really bad, which is why we need the insurance premium now and why we really should be prepared to make some sacrifices if necessary now in order to remove that possibly colossal irreversible risk from our grandchildren who may still be alive in the early 22nd century. It's so refreshing, Martin, to hear a scientist talk about the uncertainty in the science because uh, this is so pertinent, I think, to, to climate denial, particularly as it manifests in, in the States, um, which, and, which is kind of a almost a result of a sort of fault on both sides of digging in uncertainty you know, it's absolutely not going to happen, um, or it, or the science is absolutely fixed. I mean, Al Gore's, um, you know, uh, um, oh, I've forgotten what was his big film called? Um, Inconvenient Truth. Yeah. There we go. Yep. Like, you know, he says in that, you know, the science is finished almost. The science mm. is certain. We know this, and and um, the, and actually, the the story, and forgive me for mentioning this, but the story that explores that most interestingly is actually Michael Crichton's State of Fear, which is, uh. which is derided as a, as a climate denial novel and has rightly been taken apart in terms of the validity of its scientific evidence. Mm -hmm. But actually, as a model of the politics of, of truth and certainty and uncertainty in relation to climate change is fascinating and brilliant. Um, and that's one way, coming back to your question about the function of the stories, is to to be to know in, in what ways they're functioning and to be able to differentiate them. So you would never say read read State of Fear because it's a great model of of climate science, but you would say go and read it because it will mm. make you think about about climate denial and and uncertainty and and truth. It's it, I mean it's it's also a, I mean he, he knows how to tell a story. It's a, it's a kind of rip roaring romp with cannibalism and you know everything else you could want in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point that Sarah was making about uncertainty is, is actually one that was recognised both by business, government and academics back in the 1970s. Mm. Everybody knew this was an issue that one might have to approach without final certainty. Um, but nevertheless, people insisted upon more certainty than we had. Mm. And I think really there are, there are strong questions about whether or not they made the correct judgment then. Um, mm. And one of the reasons that it became so polarized around political lines was that uh, Republicans in the United States linked discussions about environment with regulation and in, in the crudest forms with socialism. And they've been trying to, to see environmental sciences and environmentalism as being closely linked and linked climate change to that uh, and tied it all into an ideological program that I think is actually inappropriate for understanding the way that scientists themselves were approaching it, but was very important in understanding the relations between government and business and, and public opinion in the United States. Yes, I think I think to be to be <laughs> to play devil's advocate, advocate, I don't think it's just the Republicans that did that. I mean, I think you, you can trace that back to something like um, Silent Spring, where um, she purposely chose to present only the worst case scenario. Um, and not present this p potential sort of beneficial um, uses of pesticides, for instance. And there, there is work that's been done on on on, on Rachel Carson's Silent Spring that that locates a kind of partisan divide there. So it, it, I would be careful about kind of just blaming it on on one side or the other. I think Al Gore, although he thought he was doing a lot of good, 
by splicing the narrative of his kind of election campaign in with the narrative of climate change in that film, um, absolutely conflated the two in ways that were detrimental. Yeah, I'm not actually, um, I, I agree with you, one doesn't want to um, take it simply down part, partisan lines. But um, I think em empirically, you can see that many of the early critics of climate science uh, were in fact approaching it on political and economic grounds and were in fact integrated into um, Republican decision making and um, were put on committees uh, by Republican um, uh, uh, presidents. Um, so there are some real links there that, that, that make that story. Um, and it's also in interesting that, that Rachel Carson made a very important point about the, the kinds of different sciences that were important to understand the effect of chemical pest, pesticides. And she focused on biological evidence. And indus, industrial figures hadn't explored biological evidence. They'd focused upon the chemistry and a, a couple of known pests. So she very much widened the, the kinds of causal pictures that were, one was interested in, in in those stories. OK, let's have another quick catch up. Yes, good idea. Firstly, a useful distinction. Weather and climate are different things. Weather is how we experience the climate. According to NASA, always a good source for this sort of thing, climate is how the atmosphere behaves over a relatively long period of time, which is pretty hard for us mere mortals to perceive directly. All hail NASA. But maybe we're beginning to take climate change more seriously now because we are starting to see its effects in more extreme weather events. Extreme weather which even wealthy countries are experiencing, like Diane mentioned in episode 3. And coming back to stories, Richard highlighted the importance of indigenous knowledge, which is often shared through stories. For example, colonial explorers Cook and Banks didn't use the wealth of the traditional knowledge of the Darawal people, who had a shared cultural memory of how the climate of their area had changed over time. Also, for anyone interested in the book Sarah mentioned by Alexis Wright, it's actually called The Swan Book, not Black Swan. But I think both are emotional roller coasters, so hold on tight. Um, no black swans in Cambridge, however. Sorry to report, uh, the hippos ate them all. That's, that's not true. Don't listen to him. Listen to instead to what our guests were saying about how stories about climate change differ around the world. Yes. So, for example, in Australia, it's all about drought, fires and water scarcity, whereas here in the UK, it's about storms, floods and too much water. And it's not only the geographical setting which affects us, but also the political and the cultural setting. For example, the difference in attitude towards climate change demonstrated by the UK's Conservative Party and the Republican Party in the US. Channeling Tolkien and all things Lord of the Rings, Sarah reminded us that there can't be one story to save them all. We couldn't see her when recording, so for all we know, she was wearing a grey robe and holding a wooden staff. OK, this reminds me of episode one and Mike Hume's point about how it's impossible to have one single strategic narrative because it completely misunderstands human socialization. So, Basically, think about the subtleties, complexities and diversity of people's experience when it comes to climate change. All need to be respected, which makes it harder to bring people together to tackle the problem. And now we get to the charismatic megafauna. I cannot tell you how disappointed I was to discover that this does not in fact refer to giraffes that can tell really good wedding speeches, or dolphins that know how to sweet talk your mum when they're over for tea. I'm really sorry about that. No, charismatic megafauna are basically the poster children of the animal kingdom. They have symbolic value or widespread appeal. So think giant pandas, polar bears, humpback whales. And the issue is that although they attract attention to the cause of climate change, which is good, they also take away attention from the uncharismatic creatures which are also suffering. Like the humphead wrasse, a species of coral reef fish that grows up to about six feet in length and sports a prominent bulge on its forehead. Or like the octopus that is fed up of being the life of the party and is really at heart an introvert and who just wants to stay at home playing sporkle quizzes all evening. Of course, I can honestly say that with 100% certainty, that is not what we're talking about here. Changing topic... Did you catch the point about how any story which assumes a steady climate is in fact a story about climate change? 
basically, with climate change going on, a story which assumes an unchanging climate looks increasingly like wishful thinking. Did you catch that mention of a study by BAFTA run between 2017 and 18? Apparently, words associated with sustainability and climate change were mentioned only 3,125 times, about as much as zombies and having a wee. I wonder how many times those things were all mentioned together in the same sentence. You know, like, somebody better warn that zombie having a wee over there that if he doesn't move soon, the climate will change and he'll be stuck in that position forever. Yeah, so just to put that number of mentions of climate change 3,125 times into perspective, according to the BAFTA website, beer was mentioned 21,648 times, sex 56,307 times, and T, 60,060 times. Finally, I have proof that British television is just sex and tea, tea and sex. Tell me that isn't a pretty decent summary of Bake Off. Ignoring that, I'm going to highlight what Martin said about using stories when talking to politicians and policymakers. Apparently, stories about climate change that are more graphic are more impactful especially when it comes to predictions about the future. He said that it's hard to give people direct evidence of what is happening now to the climate because of natural variations and that you have to look at things from a broader perspective and then, I guess, tell a story about it. Jim Hansen and the 1980s came up again. Remember him from episode one? Of course I do. Jim and the shoulder pads. He was ready to act, but others wanted more evidence, which delayed action. Martin says there are still some uncertainties in the science. He said, Shall I put on my Martin Rees voice? No, I can think of nothing worse. He said the most likely scenario is pretty bad, but there's a 5% chance of something really, really bad. Basically, Martin thinks that the less likely but far worse outcome is a stronger motivation for action. Scientists figure out what is happening, but politicians are the ones who decide what to do about it and when to do something about it. Well, Let's return to the conversation to see if we can't explore this idea a little further and find out about what the most compelling story might be. I want to try and uh, um, and butt in here, um, but here's a question for all of you. So in an earlier episode of the podcast, Mike Hume, who we were talking mm. to, told us that it's impossible to create a single compelling story or narrative around climate change. What do you guys think about that? Is it possible to find the story which we can tell, um, you know, which helps uh, encourage action? Um, no, I think it's, it's very hard. But, um, but g going back to what Sarah was saying, um, it's true that the deniers um, are perhaps uh, commercially motivated or politically motivated. Often the same people who oppose the view that uh, smoking uh, caused lung cancer. There's a, a nice book called, uh, uh, which attacks both these uh, mm. ideas by uh, Naomi Oreskes. So I think there is this view. But I think, to be, to be clear, uh, what we do know is that the world is warming just by carbon dioxide. That's simple physics. It's been known since uh, the end of the 19th century. But that effect is not huge. The carbon dioxide doubles, the temperature of the world on average goes up by a bit more than one degree. But there are all kinds of feedback effects. If the temperature gets higher, there's more water vapor, cloud cover changes completely, and all those are much more complicated. So the reason even the latest models are still uncertain, and if you look at the graphs, they do show a big um, range of uncertainty, it's because of the very complicated effects. We don't know how the cloud cover changes uh, as the climate uh, changes and weather patterns move. So there is a lot of uncertainty, but it's also quite right that we have to guard against the uh, worst case. We pay an insurance premium as we do in many other uh, contexts. But the difficult thing is that the time scale is long. It's very hard to get people who've got immediate worries and businesses that have short term worries and discount the future to really care about uh, what may happen um, in the second half of this century, because I think everyone agrees that the really bad effects won't come until then. There'll be some bad effects, more extreme weather, etc. That's already happening. But the really bad and the possible irreversible effects, things like starting the melting of Greenland's ice cap, which would go on for centuries, that sort of uh, tipping point 
may not happen for more than 50 years. And to get people to care now about doing something to reduce the chance of such a catastrophe is a big ask for politicians. Sarah, what do you think here, perhaps, about this idea of trying to, you know, find or create the story or the narrative which might compel some of that that action, perhaps um, in the policy community, like like Martin was talking about? Um, I, I have huge respect for Mike Hume's work. It's it's wonderful. Um, he has a great uh, little think piece called, you know, Welcome to the Humanities. He's he's been a, a really strong advocate of humanities knowledge being incorporated into uh, thinking about climate change. And I think he's right on this one. And he's he's right for a number of reasons. It, there's no one story because because climate change is a, we use it's a placeholder term for a massively complex phenomena that that Martin has, has wonderfully kind of explained some bits of. Um, and we, we can't you can't tell a story about something that big. I think what, what we need in terms of storytelling is lots of different stories specific to uh, local places and local times, but also breaking down some aspects of this phenomenon. So something like um, The Carbon Diaries, which is a young adult novel, um, it, it focuses on carbon um, and people have carbon credits and once they've spent them, they've spent them. And so it materialises something abstract that's part of that complex system in a way people can start to understand. And I think those those kinds of stories that start to break down bits of it. There's another wonderful film as well called In Time, which isn't really about climate change it's more about economics and capitalism but again there's a sort of a physical manifestation manifestation of an abstract concept and i think that is hugely important i also think that that we're wrong if we're only thinking about storytelling you have to think about story listening as well decision makers have to think about the stories that are already out there um, and the ones that they're not listening to or the ones that they're not hearing. Uh, and I think there's too much focus on we've got to we've got to tell stories, we've got to persuade people and not enough focus on going, well, let's just listen to people and, and, and maybe we can learn and make decisions and provoke action that way. What are the reason? What are some of the reasons to be optimistic? We can be optimistic because the future hasn't happened yet. Uh, some things we've done already. Uh, you're laughing, but it's an important point. Some some things that we've done already can't be changed, but we can change other things. And if we don't have hope and we don't believe that we can change some things or that we can adapt the way we live in order to cope and survive with the things we've already changed, then that leads us to despair and apocalypse. And I don't think that that's productive or helpful in any way whatsoever. And I'll take a, a slightly historical perspective and, and compare... Um, the last century with this century. And if we recognise that in the last century we were dealing with European and world wars, um, and in this century we're dealing with pandemics and climate... In fact, in some ways, um, we're facing a slightly rosier picture than being at each other's throats. Can I come come in again um, on this point and, uh, and offer some optimism win-win situation. The first point to say is that uh, what we do in this country alone in terms of reducing our carbon dioxide makes less than 2% difference to the world. It's trivial compared to the rest of the world. What matters is what happens in China, India, and the developing world that's going to need more energy in the future than it has now. So what we really ought to be doing in this country is noting that although we are less than 2% of the world's emissions of CO2, we're more than 2% of the world's clever ideas. And so we ought to have a a grand program to do all we can to develop more efficient uh, ways of growing food and of getting carbon-free energy uh, for ourselves and for the developing world. Because in India, uh, they now get energy by uh, smoky stoves, burning wood or dung in their homes, very unhealthy. They're clearly going to build lots of coal-fired power stations um, as they need more energy as they develop. But uh, if uh, clean energy comes down in cost so they can leapfrog directly to it, just like they've uh, leapfrogged directly to mobile phones and never had landlines, then, of course, uh, they will become carbon-free uh, as well as us. And that's what really matters. So I think the most inspiring goal for young scientists and engineers now is to try and 
and do research and development so that we can provide clean energy, not just for ourselves, that's a trivial matter, but for the uh, developing world. That's a very inspiring goal, I think, for young engineers. I think that's absolutely right. And um, the point about India is, is an interesting one, because uh, one of the reasons that Australia is performing so poorly in, in terms of cli- adapting to climate change is Australia is very interested in selling its coal to places like India. India and China. Mm. Yeah. I'm just going to quickly jump in here. Um, we started at the beginning asking a question, is climate change actually being taken seriously now? If so, why and why not? Well, I think there has been a shift. I think the uh, big shift in the last couple of years has been that big business starts to take it seriously. Um, The divestment campaign, I think, has been very helpful. It certainly caused the the shares in the big oil companies to plummet uh, and to make them feel they've got to uh, change the focus of their activities. And so I think there has been a change. And uh, I think um, um, the US, which has been a big impediment, of course, in the last four four years, when hopes will be more positive under the new regime. Um, So I think there has been some change. And um, uh, let's hope that we in the UK can uh, help to push it along. But I I really think that the win-win situation of uh, of redirecting R&D so that we uh, prioritise getting clean energy, that should be an attractive goal. And also, uh, I think... Can I make one other point that uh, it's not just scientists who can make these cases. It's got to be charismatic individuals. Um, let, let me give an example which uh, uh, um, struck me very much. Um, Mr. Michael Gove is not a very enlightened politician, but you may remember <laughs> that he, um, as Minister of the Environment, he introduced legislation to um, uh, ban non-reusable plastic drinking straws and similar things uh, because of pollution of the ocean. And He only did that because um, uh, he knew that the public had become aware of this issue. They became aware of it not because of politicians, not because of scientists, but because of David Attenborough's Blue Planet programs, showing the um, albatross returning to its nest and coughing up for its young, not the long-for nourishment, but uh, bits of plastic. That's an iconic image for um, ocean pollution, just like the... uh, polar bear and the melting ice flow is for climate change. And um, Gove knew that he would not lose votes by doing this. And so we've got to uh, engage the public. And I think the um, uh, uh, charismatic people like David Attenborough can do this. And I would also say religions can. Um, uh, The um, uh, papal encyclical in 2015, uh, before the Paris Climate Conference, had a really, really big effect because uh, the Pope has a billion followers in the Latin America, Africa and East Asia. And it was far easier to get consensus at that conference because uh, the Pope had got a standing ovation at the UN and everyone thought that the environment mattered. It's the first time a Pope had said that the non-human environment matters and it's not just there for humans to use. And so I think charismatic figures like that can make a difference. So I do think that there may be a big sea change in that uh, if we get more people like that and big business as well, uh, then there can be a gradual shift and a willingness to um, uh, redirect our technology. I, I totally agree. I think there's another group that we we should bear in mind as well, which is young, which is young people. Oh, yeah. Um, well, of course, yeah. um, we should welcome the uh, uh, the campaigning by young people, um, and it's understandable that they're often 30 years ahead of their of the, of the, uh, their elders because they'd be alive at the end of the century and um uh, well i was on, on another panel just uh, just yesterday uh talking about students and i and i i'm very old and um i was campaigning for C- cnd um anti-vietnam war um anti-apartheid and things like that and um all those things are now thought absolutely right and similarly we ought to realise that what the young people are campaigning for um, is perhaps more far-sighted than what the older are doing. And so we should encourage them. Rich and I both being very polite. Who wants to go first? <laughs> very quiet. I thought you were just avoiding the question. <laughs> <laughs> so as a historian, I would say uh, we've been asking that question for 70 years. Um, and we've not yet been able to answer it fully, and we're still not taking it seriously enough. Yeah, I I would come at it as a kind of both-and response. Um, Again, you have to break it down. (laughs) 
who who's taking it seriously? So you know, you could say that that policymakers and governance is taking it seriously. You know, COP twenty six is meant to be happening in um, the UK this year has been postponed to next. We've got the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, uh, Martin's already mentioned that industry is starting to take it more seriously due to um, both pressures, but also just a simple recognition that, you know, if you want to sustain your business, you're going to have to figure out how to um, make it you know, more environmentally friendly. Uh, I, an example is, you know, air, aircraft fuel has actually become much more um, environmentally friendly and efficient over the last 10 years or so. And, and there's a huge amount of research and development about how to fuel aeroplanes differently then you've got our individuals taking it seriously and that you would have to break down by by region and locale and race and class um, and then you've got our you know our stories and popular narratives taking it seriously so it, it's a very academic answer isn't it which is you've got to break down the question but I really think you do um, yeah. because it, because it's so important that we start to break it down and we start to think about how we can target all these different areas and different ways in which all of those different areas can be uh, leveraged or encouraged or or, or listened to um, to move towards a collective uh, taking seriously. That's right. And it's also important to know that although urgency is required, if we can't approach this in, the, in an urgent register all the time. Yeah. Um, and we have to realise the ordinary ways that the climate is, is significant for us. Yeah. The other thing that Martin mentioned that I wanted to pick up on was the idea of, of scale. Um, because this is something that people in the humanities have been thinking about for a long time. There was a book from the States called Slow Violence, which precisely thinking about how difficult we find it to comprehend slow rather than fast violence. But stories can really have a role to play here as well because of the way in which narrative can move across vast sweeps of, of time within the pages of just a single book. Um, there's ways in which... Uh, reading those kinds of stories and and my my favorite example would be um the american writer nk jemison's um broken earth trilogy which is just a modern masterpiece um which which roams across massive um sort of geological times and shows the way in which people in the present of of the narrative are living with and dealing with the climatic effects of of advanced technologies from from centuries before that's a way of starting to help people get their heads around this this very long view and it's a different way to saying you've got to do it for your grandchildren which is that which is the kind of often the, the motivator um and and the other thing is that i think we need to we need to have stories about how to stop it but we also need to recognize that some of the things we've done can't be stopped now um, and that and that we have to, as well as how to stop it, um, we need to have stories about risk and resilience and about to, how to live with the changes that we've already set in motion. Well, we've reached the end. And what did we learn? Um, Martin pointed out how complex the science is when it comes to climate change and that this is one of the reasons why there is uncertainty in the scientific models. He also mentioned that the timescale here is pretty long. People in business have so many short-term worries. Like, how many cream eggs is too many cream eggs? No, not like that. But with so many short-term worries, it makes it hard to care about what Martin called the really bad effects, which are expected in the second half of this century. Sarah Dillon joined team Mike Hume and Sarah Dry from episode one, saying that we need lots and lots of different stories about climate change, each specific to different groups of people and different places. But she also added that some stories need to break down the science of climate change and focus on making real those abstract concepts, like carbon emissions, which we can't see or feel directly. Although Sarah's example here was actually about carbon credits rather than carbon itself. As we know, Hugh Hunt would make CO2 real by making it brown and smelly. Thanks again for that, Hugh. And we need to think about what stories we're not listening to and not hearing. You mean like the story of the introvert octopus who loves Sporkle? No, no, no. That is not what I mean. Or what Sarah means. That is a shame. Um, did we get any reasons to be optimistic, though? Yes, we did. Sarah reminded us that the future hasn't happened yet, which might seem obvious, but the point is that we can still change some things and we should focus on that. Richard said that although we've had the pandemic, we've been lucky enough not to suffer any world wars this century so far. Which is, I guess, good news, even if it does feel like a bit of a low bar. 
That's a very low bar. And Martin said that although the UK is not, in the grand scheme of things, a big CO2 emitter, this little country still has a lot to offer the world in terms of ideas and innovations and should have a role to play in helping the world to become a carbon neutral place. If you remember Emily Schuckbauer from episode two, her organization Cambridge Zero is busy providing advice to government on how the UK can help the world curb climate change in line with the Paris Agreement. Yay, Cambridge Zero. But back to our original question this episode, whether or not climate change is finally being taken seriously. Yes, Martin told us that big business is starting to take climate change more seriously and that the US will hopefully be more helpful with the new administration. He also mentioned that our own charismatic megafauna, by which I mean Sir David Attenborough and the Pope, are also helping. Martin also mentioned that young people are more far-sighted than we might often give them credit for. After all, they're the ones who will be alive at the end of this century, and living through the effects of climate change we are now just trying to predict. Sarah and Richard were a bit more cautious. Some people are taking climate change more seriously, and some aren't, they said. But they do suggest that the stories we need to tell should focus on a mixture of things. How to stop climate change, the risks it creates, and how we can be resilient in the face of all this potentially dangerous change. Well, not only is that the end of this episode, but also the end of the series. We've enjoyed ourselves immensely putting this series together, and we hope you've enjoyed yourselves listening. Yes, so in the anticipation of our next series, please like and subscribe to Mind Over Chatter on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to leave us a review. A really, really, really good one. And don't forget to tell your friends, family, the members of the local bowling club, and all three of the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. Just tell all living things. (laughs) A huge thanks once again to our guests, Richard Staley, Sarah Dillon, and Martin Rees. And as ever, to Naomi Clements Broad for the incredible production and general lurking. Music was by the extremely talented Carlo Ladd and artwork was by the equally talented Alex Sadler.